Welcome to Education Insight. I'm Lacey Candle. For years, economists in inland Southern California have insisted that colleges like UC Riverside, Cal Baptist, Cal State San Bernardino, and local community colleges are critical to our region because they not only provide education and job training, they also attract research funding. They foster local innovation and they create a lot of jobs. In the last few years, Sacramento and Washington lawmakers have introduced many initiatives to provide even more funding for student tuitions so that every student can make it to a four-year degree. But should every student receive a four-year degree? One economist says no. I would rather have a member of our low-income community be successful at a community college or even just a one-year certificate. I would rather have them be successful there than fail at a four-year institution. A discussion on the effects of education on economics and vice versa in just a moment. But first, a look at what folks are talking about in education this week. After a major California charter school fraud case, a task force has made 20 recommendations for all charter schools in the state. The fraud involved the A3 Charter Network in San Diego, which stole millions in state funds through fraudulent student enrollments. The new report calls for improved training and oversight for school auditors across the board. Auditors had failed to detect fraudulent activities in the schools, highlighting the need for stricter controls. The key recommendations made included monthly tracking of student enrollments to catch fraud earlier and requiring auditors to complete 24 hours of school-specific training before certification even occurs. Another focus is on addressing conflicts of interest between charter schools and their vendors. The report recommends disclosure of top paid employees and contractors to prevent collusion. Non-classroom-based charter schools, where oversight is often weakest, have become some of the worst fraud cases in California and in the United States. Many of the task force's recommendations will require legislative action, such as the proposal to create a statewide inspector general's office. With the moratorium on new non-classroom-based charter schools ending in 2026, the reforms need to be implemented very soon. Lawmakers will likely face pressure to act before the moratorium expires. On today's Education Insight, we are taking a look at the impact that high school, college, and university education is having on economics. Dr. Timothy Nadro is a professor of economics at Washington State University and at the University of Idaho. He is additionally the founder of the Recon Insight Group. That's a research firm that helps local communities, including the Inland Empire, to make difficult economic decisions. He shares with us today his thoughts on the value of our local education and its effect on economics based on those interactions. Dr. Nadro, thank you for joining us on Education Insight. Thank you, Lacey. I'm happy to be here. Could you tell us or describe how education directly influences the economic development of a community like ours? Yeah, so I, I think the relationship between education and economic development is, is quite clear and that those two concepts as they are measured uh, move together. More education is correlated with more economic activity. But I, I would pause also and say that how we measure the quantity of education is not as robust as it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And we don't have excellent measures of economic development either. What we have are excellent measures of credentials, not necessarily education. And we have excellent measures of economic output, which isn't quite the same thing as development. In those measurements, what have you seen as some of the significant economic barriers that are preventing folks from accessing 
quality education, especially here in the Inland Empire? Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping we get to talk about the Inland Empire a little bit more because one of the things I think they've done well with their education system is they've preserved the integrity of the community and technical college system, the two-year programs. And so I, I think that that's a, a huge asset, whereas a lot of the, the rest of the nation has forsaken those, those programs for the four-year institutions. And I think that that is in and of itself a barrier. But I would, I would say that most of the discussion around barriers to education are largely superficial in that they focused almost exclusively on covering direct costs. So this would be like tuition assistance, childcare, et cetera. But those costs are not the major impediment to educational attainment. Mm. Um, it is the opportunity costs incurred by sitting in a classroom and foregoing the earnings that could have been made by not going to college. Right. So yeah. if I go to if I go to college, I'm sitting in a classroom and I might be giving up 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year to go to college. And if I'm from a lower income strata, I can't really afford to give those costs up. But I would also pause. And I think that another reason that our discussion around barriers is problematic is because we're always looking to remove those barriers. And I don't think we actually value barriers appropriately. Okay, we don't consider the consequences of removing all of those barriers. If you make obtaining an education easy and costless, it won't be valuable. And we tend to forget that. The, the reason we have a crisis in higher education today is partly because there's so little sacrifice in obtaining it. Mm -hmm. Wow. I've, I've never heard anybody say that here on Education Insight, but it's surely a perspective we have not in California considered much at all. I can't help but wonder, though, isn't deciding to grow the value of higher education instead of increasing access come at the cost of widening inequality and increasing our dependence on welfare? in the most impoverished parts of San Bernardino and even our whole region? I think that a system exists there for our lower income folks to get educated. It happens in stages, Lacey. It doesn't happen automatically. So, you know, you know, my father, as an example, got his associate's degree, but never actually finished his bachelor's, right? But he, because of the growth that he made at that stage, I was able to stand on his shoulders and go farther. Uh, and hopefully my kids are going to be able to stand on my shoulders and go even farther. And so just like economic development is a process, human capital development is a process. We want people to take that next step. But let me put it this way. I would rather have a member of our low income community be successful at a community college or even just a one year certificate. I would rather have them be successful there than fail at a four-year institution, mm -hmm. right? Getting the matching between the individual and the program right is important and difficult. Oftentimes, we want to circumvent that process, and we just want people to jettison straight into affluence with a high education, and it rarely works that way. It's part of the reason we have large failure rates and dropout rates from our higher institutions. We need to embrace the process that exists and the system that exists for getting people to successful levels. But we have to understand that it might take generations and we have to be OK with that. So how do educational institutions play a role in shaping regional development strategies, now particularly in areas like job creation and industry growth? There's two ways that you can come at this. I think that higher education has had some scope creep for a long time now. So if you're talking about job training, skills development, and industry alignment, I think in all of those areas, community and technical colleges are more efficient and more cost effective at delivering those services than the universities are. The universities have been, like I said before, kind of forsaking the roles of those community colleges. And so it's becoming harder to get that industry alignment. And I think that what students are realizing, specifically in some of the high tech fields, is that they can get training and credentials and certificates 
from non-traditional sources, going and getting programming skills, going to a program data camp type thing. And that's enough to get them, get a foot in the door with some of these data analytics and tech companies now. And so I think that if higher education wants to remain relevant, they need to be interacting with their county commissioners, their city councilors, and other decision makers to make sure that they understand what the vision and focus of those individuals are for the the local communities that they're in. And then they need to make sure that they're aligning their offerings with those visions. What are the actual long-term economic benefits that communities do experience when they invest in their local education sources? The concept of a long term is difficult for economists. It has a technical definition. And so I think if we're talking in colloquial terms, I guess the easiest way to say this is uh, that as the number of educated individuals start to accumulate in an economy, there's an increase in the productivity of the region. Often education makes the local capital assets more effective. We like to say that economic development is not univariate. There's not just one variable that matters here. So it's not just education that matters. You need to have the right capital assets. You need to have the right infrastructure and the right institutions in place to make that education pop, to make it really valuable Mm -hmm. to the community. And if you don't have those other institutions, capital assets in place, the education won't be as valuable and productive in the economy as it otherwise could be. So so you need several pieces to be working in tandem. Yeah. Coming up, we'll have more of our conversation on how education affects our local economics and vice versa with Dr. Timothy Nadro of the Recon Insight Group. This is Education Insight. Welcome back to Education Insight. Today we're discussing education and economics. Our guest is economist Timothy Nadro, a professor of economics and the founder of the Recon Insight Group, which helps local communities like ours make tough economic decisions. Doctor, how does an education system uh, actually do the work of adapting to constantly evolving needs of the local community, especially when they're needed to quickly develop these new programs that are teaching students these new workforce skills. How's that even done? Yeah, I don't think people understand the entire costs that are embedded in developing a new program and in acquiring new instructors. And so a lot of this adaptation has to be done with industry partners. Uh And so designing processes needs to be done in conjunction with industry. And again, I think community and technical colleges are just more adept at that. The university system has kind of core tenants that don't change. Things like math departments and physics departments, history departments as well, you know, liberal arts departments as well. And so if you want forced training program, I think that the two-year programs are more adept at providing those offerings. I'm not trying to throw the universities under the bus here. It's just that they have a different mission. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get back to the, if we're getting to the workforce training issues, I think we've got to go back to those two-year programs. And I think that they are, they are becoming good. We, I did a curriculum design for NYU School of Professional Studies sometime back. It was called Tools and Techniques for Understanding Urban Economies. And I was working in industry at the time, and they approached us about helping to develop that curriculum. And we were able to get the students enrolled quickly in this new program. It was a short course. I think it was actually eight weeks intensive training with those students. 
So it can be done, but I think that it needs to be done with industry partners. And I, I hope that we actually get to talk about a case study where this was done really well. Let's do that right now. What case study comes to your mind when thinking about this? Yeah, so one of the community colleges that I used to work with um, and consult with had um, partnered with John Deere for a mechanics program at their college. And they had set it up so that John Deere basically would hire any of the students that graduated from the program. So they had a 100% placement rate for these students, which is awesome. Uh, The students were trained on John Deere equipment and trained by John Deere technicians. Uh, And I think that they've rolled this out nationwide. But the students that go into that program are then able, once they graduate, to hit the ground running. Right. That's the type of private public partnership that we want to see at these community colleges. It's an education that is really meaningful, not just to the students, but to their future employers. And it makes it affordable to the education institution. To- yeah, I think that's I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, John Deere basically did the cu- curriculum design for them because they knew what they needed from their the graduates, and and so, and I think John Deere even provided some of their technicians to be in the classroom. We need more of that type of of interaction. So, what strategies could our community lean into to strengthen the relationship between our education system and economic growth in our underserved areas? Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's a lift. What I would like to see, I think that in a lot of these underserved areas, there's cultural barriers that exist, and so I think that you see a lot of individuals wanting to get into employment. I think that the industry needs to recognize that they need a mix of employees and they need to be able to approach certain individuals and certain families in certain areas and say, look, we would really like to have you here, but we need you to get an education in this area. So I've actually seen this in some of the um, agricultural industries, the large corporate farms that are saying, look, you, you have been working for us for a while. We appreciate the service. We want to send you back to school because we think that you can be more effective for us. You can be more profitable for us, and you can be making more income for yourself if we get you this education. But that requires the the employer to know what kind of offerings are available at the schools there as well. And so, again, I think that that industry and and institutional alignment needs, needs to take place, and then we need to be able to convince our employees that education is not a bad thing and it's not going to prevent them from making a paycheck and being able to be successful in the firm itself. Dr. Nadro, you gave us a great example of John Deere helping out a community college. I'm wondering, could you share an example of a community where innovative educational initiatives successfully changed their local economic conditions? Let me give you let me give you two. Okay. One of my favorite examples is from Walla Walla Community College in Washington. President at the time was a gentleman called Steve Van Ostel, and he was a friend of mine. Did some consulting with him. And they had, I believe it was the first analogy and viticultural program in the state of Washington. And because of the region that they're in, they're Uh, soil acidity, their climate, their terroir, they became a primary wine producing region in Washington. And I think I did this study back in 2011 and then updated it, I think, in 2017. And at that time, they had more 90 plus ranked wines per vintage than Napa and Sonoma counties. Uh, They were like a premier wine region. And it was in no small part because of the analogy and viticultural program that they had at the community college. So when we were looking at the economic uh, situation there, we found that the wine cluster in Walla Walla actually generated growth in the community and that without that wine cluster and really without that analogy and viticultural program, that community would have been in a recession. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the first story where I think that 
the regional comparative advantages were tied with the, the program design and everything just came together really smoothly. The other one, I can't remember where this happened, but I believe it was a GE like refrigerator manufacturing plant or washing machine manufacturing plant was shutting down. And the community realized that they were all going to lose their jobs. And what they realized is, well, let's think about what skills we have in the region. And then they went out and recruited a wind turbine manufacturer to come into their region. And that was just a perfect example of people saying, we're not going to take this lying down. Yeah. We've got the skills. We don't want to leave our homes. And they were able to work with, you know, they, they basically showed we have this pipeline of knowledge and skills and community colleges and programs here. Let's bring in a new employer that can and have us pivot. I think those are the kind of stories that really show where educational initiatives and economics really intersect with sure. each other. Yeah. You mentioned alternative energies, and I'm wondering how has the rise of technology in education impacted San Bernardino and Riverside communities or communities like ours, both positively and negatively? This is a difficult question. I talk a lot at Recon about the difference between surveillance data and reconnaissance data. And surveillance data is data and information that is routinely collected. Right? This, this is like employment and unemployment numbers, educational attainment data, industry output data, that kind of stuff is all surveillance data. What's hard for me when I'm talking about a specific area is the reconnaissance data, which is the on the ground, boots on the ground kind of knowledge. And I guess I don't, I haven't spent enough time in San Bernardino and Riverside to say explicitly how technology has affected them. I can tell you that from the data, the surveillance data that I've looked at, that that region, the Inland Empire, has a natural advantage in transportation and warehousing. And that looks to be where a lot of technology is being invested uh -huh. in, in that industry, specifically within the region. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that what you're, from a development standpoint, a lot of people will look at those jobs and say those are lower income jobs in the transportation warehousing sector. But I don't think that that has to be. I think that when you have the technological infrastructure in place, you're going to need more technologically proficient individuals in those jobs. And so this is a good example of development. I, I mentioned before that there's a difference between development and growth. And growth is just more stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's more. Development is more value. It's not more stuff, it's more value. And so I think what you're going to start to see is, is that these are going to end up being higher valued jobs in the future. And then you're going to have to embrace that. I don't think that you get away from those types of natural advantages lightly. And so the key is how can we get the jobs in these sectors to be high wage jobs? How can we develop that, those job offerings? As someone who studies data and economics as it pertains to education, when thinking about a region like ours, specifically the Inland Empire, what would you wish to see for us in the next decade? when it comes to the impact that our local colleges and universities, even our high schools, might have on the local economy in the near future? This is, again, not an easy conversation to have. We've drifted into trying to minimize our costs. And so we drift into selling and issuing credentials rather than actually doing the hard work of providing an education to the individual. And that transfer of knowledge is important. And we don't always make sure that the knowledge has been transferred. So we need to keep the standards of education high. When a student graduates from high school, they need to be able to do algebra and understand what they're doing. Uh, they need to be able to read things as complicated as Beowulf and understand it. Otherwise, the credential does not signal competence to the industry. It doesn't signal competence in the subject matter. 
And when those students get into the workforce, employers are going to be stuck with the training costs that they thought had already been incurred. Mm -hmm. And so we want an educated society, not a credentialed society, because the education is what makes the individual productive, not the credential. On the phone with us today, Dr. Timothy Nadro, professor of economics at Washington State University and also at the University of Idaho. He is additionally the founder of Recon Insight Group. It's a research firm that helps local communities like the Inland Empire make those difficult economic decisions. Dr. Nadro, we appreciate you taking the time to take our call and explain all this on Education Insight today. Thank you, Lacey. It's been a pleasure. You may find it surprising that the state of California is actually home to over 110 Native American tribes. And while there are 37 accredited tribal colleges and universities in the U.S., there isn't one in our state. However, many people believe that the California Indian Nations College in Palm Desert is about to become our first. Operating since 2017, they are in the middle of accreditation. Student curriculum includes indigenous culture courses, native language revitalization, and courses in traditional Native American values. Next week, we sit down with President Celeste Townsend to hear about their vision. Join us for another edition of Education Insight. I'm Lacey Kendall. Until then... Have a great week. Education Insight is produced in partnership with KVCR San Bernardino. Our executive producer is Jacob Poor. And our production engineer is Tyler Vizi. And Lacey Kendall is your host. Support is provided by College Futures Foundation. Some technical assistance provided by the College of Arts and Letters at Cal State San Bernardino. Growing Inland Achievement. Working together for inland education and economic success. Join us again next week for Education Insight.